happy to have uh, David tonight. Uh, so David actually came to Singapore one year ago. Uh, he was actually visiting and speaking for a conference. Uh, I think it was for Oracle World, if I'm correct. Yep. And uh, yeah, and uh, yeah, it was pretty awesome. It was a really good uh, meet up with him, and we thought to invite him again. And uh, so today, like, we'll be more talking about core features of Java, uh, like okay, what to expect in the future and what we have in the newest versions of uh, Java. So we are very happy to have David uh, virtually today and hope to have him in person again in the future. Thank you, David. Thank you. Well, in, yeah, in fact, I was supposed to come back, I think, in June. But yeah, um, anyway, thanks for having me. So despite, oops, sorry. Uh, despite the hot situation, I'm very happy to be able to give this remote presentation. So um, the title of the session is Java in the 40 version. Um, the thing is that more and more I realize that given we have accelerated the cadence of the Java release, people are, are somehow confused about uh, what's in Java. So today what I want to uh, share with you is basically what features will be added uh, in 2020 uh, in the Java platform. Uh, why, why 40? Well, I'm French speaking and uh, I always confuse uh, 40 and 14. So uh, given that we have just released really version 14 of Java, this is really what I'm going to talk today. Having said that, I will also discuss about Java 15, which, is, which will come uh, later this year in 2020. So this is a standard separate disclaimer from Oracle. Um, don't make any purchase decision based on what I will say today. Having said that, everything is open source. So um, we are good on that side. The only thing that you should, you should keep in mind is that any, anything that I say about Java 15 can, in theory, still change. I mean, Java 15 will be released in September. So between now and then, there might be uh, change. That's the only thing that you have to keep in mind about uh, this disclaimer. OK, uh, May is a very important month because we are about to celebrate the 25th anniversary of Java. So Java has been released, uh, the first release has been uh, released 25 years ago. So we are just about to celebrate that anniversary. The thing is that Java uh, keep evolving since 25 years based on two core principles. The first one, developer productivity. Second core principle is application performance. This has been done through the last 25 years um, in the face of uh, constantly evolving uh, things, such as program, programming paradigm. For example, 25, 20 years ago, we we're not really talking about any kind of functional uh, programming when it was, uh, when, it, when we were talking about Java. That's something since then that has been become more and more important. Something else that evolved is application style. Uh, in the beginning, we were mainly talking about uh, client-server application. Uh, we we're talking about monolith application. Those days, obviously, uh, it's more and more about uh, microservices. So this is yet another evolution that Java has to cope with. Uh, deployment styles. Uh, in the early days, we were deploying in our own data center uh, on large server. Those days, we tend to deploy uh, using containers in the cloud. So that's another big shift when it comes to uh, to the way we deploy our application. And again, Java has to cope with that. And last but not least, obviously, the hardware is evolving. So those days, for example, we have uh, more and more cores in our machines. Uh, we have more and more uh, memory. Uh, we have uh, vector support directly built into uh, general purpose computers. Uh, we have multiple level cache when it comes to memory, and so on and so on. So that's, that's, this is basically how Java has evolved for the last 25 years, and this is how it will continue to evolve. So uh, this is a pretty busy slide. I'm not going to spend time on this slide. This slide basically lists all the features that were added in Java 9. And Java 9 was a special release in the sense that it was the latest large release uh, of Java. And there is a big issue with that. So every uh, two to three years, we were uh, releasing one Java version with a bunch of features. So when it comes to adopting those features, it was very difficult because the developers basically uh, had uh, all of a sudden access to a bunch of features. So getting, a, getting familiar with those features was very difficult. So we decided to change the way Java is evolving. So now how it works. 
This is something that we have put in place um, end of 2017. So every six months, there's, there is a new uh, Java release. So it's, co it's called a feature uh, release. So uh, 11, 12, 13. The current Java release is 14, released in March. And uh, in September uh, 2020, we're going to release uh, 15. That's a given. Six months later, uh, 16, and so on, and so on. Now, all those feature releases uh, are open source and are supported until the next release uh, comes out. So 9 was supported at least until 10 came out, and so on and so on. So that means that today, 14 will be at least uh, supported un uh, until 15 uh, comes out. And when 15 will be released in September, uh, the current release will be 15. And that's basically, if you're on the open source side, you should uh, use that version because that's the, that's the version that is supported. Now, we also acknowledge that there are some users, typically enterprise, they are not able to move that rapidly. So moving from 14 to 15 is in itself not a big um, work, given that there are not that many, that many features between all those releases. But still, there are, there, are, there are some type of users that prefer to stick to one release for many, many years. So that's, what, that's why we at Oracle have decided to have long-term support release. So basically, a long-term support release is nothing more than a given feature release that we take and we maintain uh, for a very long time. Um, 11 is the current LTS. The next one uh, will be uh, 17. So those uh, releases will be supported, supported for many, many years, despite the fact that, obviously, we will still have every six months a new features release. So basically, uh, it provides choice. Either you uh, use uh, the OpenJDK build that Oracle uh, is providing. They are free. Uh, the only thing is that if you are uh, using those builds, well, you'd better uh, keep with the Java release cadence. So right now, ideally, you want to be on 14 because this is the, the, the release that is supported. And that's also the release that is getting the security uh, updates. Uh, if you are not able to move that quickly, uh, Oracle also sells support uh, for Java. That's the Oracle GDK. So when it comes to buying Oracle support, um, there are two things that you should look at. The price of that support. Um, honestly, the price of the Oracle support for Java uh, is uh, pretty cheap, but I will let you judge that. The only thing that you need to look at when you decide where you want to get your support for Java is basically the ability that the organization you are looking at is able to support you. And this slide shows uh, the number of issues that were fixed uh, in in this particular example in GDK 14. And we clearly see that Oracle is clearly the company that contributes uh, the most uh, to Java. So the takeaway here, Java uh, is still free. There, have been, there has been a lot of confusion, confusions regarding that, but uh, Java uh, is and remains free. So now let's quickly discuss about how can we enable uh, faster innovation within the platform. So the first thing that we put in place uh, two or three years ago was this new release cadence, where every six months we have a new release. Uh, we also have the JEPS, the JEPS mechanism. So uh, JEPS stands for GDK Enhance Enhancements Proposal. So it's basically a mechanism that we use to uh, introduce in the platform new Java language features, uh, new GDK features, or even um, we are using that process to remove things from the platform, or we are also using that uh, features, for example, to evolve how uh, the open the open GDK pro, uh, project uh, is is managed. So it's basically some kind of lightweight mechanism that clearly uh, that is clearly documented and tell the community how things are supposed to work when it comes to doing something non-trivial non -trivial in into the platform. Next to that, we have also put in place multiple feedback, feedback mechanism that we are using to get feedback on non-final features. So the thing is that whenever we put something into the platform, um, as soon as it's final, it's something that is there forever. So it's basically, uh, it becomes permanent. So we'd better get it right uh, before we turn something into a permanent feature within the platform. So for that, we have multiple uh, mechanisms that we can use to basically give to developers non-final features. Um, we encourage developers to use don those non-final features. And based on the feedback, we can still do uh, adjustment to those features before we make them permanent. So we have the preview features mechanism. 
which is used more for language uh, Java language features. We also have experimental features, which we use uh, mainly for hotspot VM features. And then we have adi additional features, uh, sorry, additional mechanisms such as uh, incubator uh, modules, um, early GDK access build that we use to basically give access to um, to prototype of new capabilities that we are thinking of adding into the platform. And last but not least, uh, we have an ongoing OpenJDK project that is named SCARA. So the, the goal of SCARA is uh, to investigate alternative to Mercurial. So if you are look, if you know OpenJDK, you know that for many years OpenJDK, well, in fact, since the beginning, OpenJDK has used Mercurial as its, as its uh, source code management uh, solution. It works for many years, but uh, honestly, Mercurial is a bit tough to learn. So if we want to encourage uh, more contributions, uh, well, we'd better look at alternatives. So that was the goal of that project, look at al alternatives. And the outcome uh, is um, SCARA has selected Git as the alternative. So that means that all the OpenGDK uh, development is moving to Git. SCARA has also looked at uh, hosted Git providers. Um, GitHub has been uh, selected, but clearly uh, SCARA and OpenGDK is not tied to uh, GitHub. So if something goes wrong with GitHub, we can uh, easily switch, despite the size of the project, to a different Git providers. And last but not least, Kara has also looked at how we can improve uh, the complete development lifecycle of OpenGDK by uh, adding on top of Git uh, some additional toolings. So a bunch of OpenGDK projects have already moved to uh, GitHub. Uh, we have the list here, Amber, Scara, uh, GMC, Loom, and so on and so on. And all the rest, obviously, uh, are planned to move. In fact, we plan to move GDK itself um, later around, uh, I think, end of GDK 15. So that would be uh, still in 2020 or uh, around early uh, 16. So still in 2020. Um, but still, all the projects are read only mirrors on GitHub. So basically, all those um, all those uh, bullet points give us the ability to uh, enable faster innovation within the platform. Something that we have already used, and we clearly see the benefit of all of those uh, tools. Sorry. So uh, delivering faster. So we have enabled the ability to deliver to deliver faster. And well, let's look at what we have deliver recently. When I say we, it's really the OpenGDK community. Obviously, Oracle is a big player in that community, but it's not just Oracle, right? So uh, Java 10 delivered in, uh, in March 2018. Um, those are all the features. I'm not going to spend any time on uh, those releases because we're, we already have enough to cover with uh, 14 and 15. Um, the only thing is that uh, you might see that we have two JEPs um, that are in kind of yellow orange color, those have been delivered by um, someone else than Oracle. So the one in blacks are coming from Oracle and the other one are coming from uh, other OpenGDK uh, members. And I believe those two are coming from Red Hat. Then we had uh, 11, which was a pretty big release in terms of capability. The thing to keep in mind is that any features release is driven by the dates. So it's either March or September. They are not driven by uh, features. So if, 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 if a feature is not ready to be included uh, in a given feature release, well, it's not an issue. It, it, that features will just have to wait the next uh, feature release. 12, March 29, uh, 13, um, September 2019, 13 was clearly a relatively small uh, release, but yeah. Anyway, 14, that was released uh, two months ago, uh, basically, uh, well, cope with the fact that 13 was really modest. But again, the only thing that did drive those releases is the, um, the dates, not the content. So today we're going to discuss uh, some of those JEPs that have been added in uh, uh, Java 14. Again, we see that there are two JEPs coming uh, from non that are not coming from Oracle. Non-volatile map by buffer, I think, is coming from uh, Red Hat, and helpful null pointer exception that we're going to discuss later is coming from SAP. Okay, so uh, Java 14 was released uh, in March 2020. Uh, everything is open source, so gdk.java.net slash 14, you can have access to the open GDK builds of 14. You can also have access to all the technical content regarding uh, that release. 
Now, quickly, uh, Java 15. What do we know about Java 15? Well, first and foremost, we know uh, that Java 15 will be released uh, in September uh, 2020. Um, we also know the schedule. So we know that uh, Ramdan phase one, that's basically when uh, we have the feature freeze, is uh, in one month from now, so 11, uh, 11th of, of June. So today, uh, based on the information that is uh, available in the OpenJDK project, we can already discuss about what's being planned within uh, 15. That's what I'm going to do today. Now, keep in mind that things can obviously still change. We can add uh, things at the very last minute, or we can even drop things at the very last minute, depending on, well, on some stability uh, issue or something else. Things can might still evolve. So uh, that, those toolings basically gives you uh, uh, the content that is plain uh, for 14. So um, we clearly, well, it's a very interesting time for Java because we clearly have a very rich uh, uh, pipeline when it comes to features. Uh, why? Because, may, well, quite as well, I wouldn't say many years ago, but five to four years ago, uh, we have decided to work on very ambitious project, uh, multiple projects that were long-term uh, R&D project, and they each had a, a goal to basically uh, either fundamentally improve certain aspect of the Java platform or even rev revamp uh, a given as aspect of the platform. So I'm going to discuss some of those today. ZGC, Amber, Panama, Valhalla, Metropolis, Loom, and so on. So very quickly. The first one that I want to discuss is uh, ZGC, Zero GC. So it's a um, low latency scalable garbage collector that we started uh, to work on a few years ago. It was introduced as a experimental features in Java 11. And the main goal of ZGC is basically uh, gives you the lowest latency possible. So it's a concurrent GC, meaning that all the heavy lifting work of the GC is done basically while your Java trades uh, are being executed. So there are a few posts, but they are uh, reduced to uh, well to the smallest uh, possible uh, to the smallest time possible. We claim that the post time should stay below 10 milliseconds with with the GC. But what we observe is that most of the time. Uh, the pose are more around two milliseconds, which obviously uh, is very low. It's scalable in the sense that the post time will not increase as you grow your heap or your life set. So uh, the 10 millisecond post time is something that you would get typically on a one gigabyte heap, but also on a one terabyte heap. So uh, there's no change in that front. Um, ZGC in the, in the early days was designed for uh, large heaps, multi-terabyte heaps, but it turns out that there are use cases uh, where it also makes sense to use ZGC for smaller heaps. So one of the features that we have added recently is the support for a few megabytes heaps. I think that the lowest that we can go is eight megabytes. So how do you use ZGC today? So I mentioned that ZGC was added as an experimental feature in uh, Java 11. So, um, you need to unlock explicitly uh, ZGC. So there is a specific hotspot flag, unlock experimental uh, VM option to basically unlock any experimental feature of the VM. So you do that and then you use the specific flag to enable ZGC. So basically to uh, tell the VM to uh, switch from G1, which is the default GC, uh, to ZGC. And there you go. Then the thing that you might want to do is tune ZGC. To tune the ZGC, the thing that you need to do basically is just set the heap size. One of the design goals of ZGC was also to um, provide a default behavior that uh, avoid any tunings. Obviously, you still have the ability to do more tuning than just setting the heap size, but uh, by default, ZGC should, should give you a good results with just setting the heap size. So ZGC. What is the history behind the GC? The GC was initially uh, introduced in 11 uh, as an ex experimental features on Linux. We have added additional capabilities uh, in 12. In 13, uh, the GC support was added for ARM64. And finally, in 14, so the release that we have done two months ago is adding support for Mac OS and Windows uh, for the GC. And the plan is to make ZGC as a production feature. So basically, we are removing that experimental flag 
from the feature in GTK uh, 15, so this year. So this is a picture that I took uh, early, uh, earlier this year in Sweden, and um, on stage was uh, Monica Beckwith from Microsoft. And well, that's our claim, it's not my claim. So ZGC shine when it comes to responsiveness. So I encourage you to check uh, her presentation, which is now online, where she goes basically about the benefit of uh, ZGC. Now let's quickly talk about G1GC. So uh, G1GC is the default GC. Uh, obviously we have made a lot of investment within uh, ZGC, but that doesn't mean that we, uh, we are not looking at improving uh, G1. So for example, in 14, we have added support for uh, NUMA. So NUMA stands for non-uniform memory access. So basically, uh, that means that some, some memory uh, might be, uh, well, the distance between the memory and the cores is not always equal. So from one core, accessing a given memory might be more expensive because it's more distant than accessing memory in a different uh, part of, uh, well, from, from a different cores. Uh, Parallel GC uh, was new more aware since, since a long time. So uh, in uh, 14, we have added support, new support for G1. And that's not all. Uh, if we look at the number of enhancements that we have done in around G1 since GK8, it's over 700 enhancements that together uh, greatly improve uh, G1. So the charts uh, shows, for example, so the charts below shows the native memory overhead caused by, the, by your G1 uh, GC for a heap size of 16 megabyte. And what we sh can see is that, well, if we look at GDK8, the extra native memory was around uh, four megabyte. In 11, it was around, well, it was below three, uh, sorry, I said megabyte, it's gigabyte. So it, uh, eight need an additional four uh, gigabyte uh, to GC that large heap. Uh, GDK 11, uh, it was uh, reduced to, I think, 2.7 gigabyte. And in 14, it's, uh, it has been uh, reduced to 1.7 uh, gigabyte. So basically, you see that by switching from 8 to 14, we have greatly reduced uh, the memory footprint of uh, G1. Not only that, we also improve the, per the performance. So basically, when you put together all those 700 enhancements that uh, improved uh, G1 a lot across all our area, so um, throughput, uh, footprint, uh, latency, and so on and so on. So that's something that you, you need to consider uh, if obviously uh, GC, well, the GC, uh, th those GC characteristics as imp are important to you. You need to think about uh, moving to a newer version of the of the platform. So um, this is another chart that shows some of the enhancements that have been done to uh, G1. So uh, let's see. Uh, this is using the standard spec GBB uh, benchmark. Uh, so this one is using a fixed hip, fixed hip so uh, set to four uh, gigabyte. Uh, all the results are normalized and higher is better. So um, we have max G ops and critical G ops. Both are looking at the throughput. The thing is that critical G, G ops is looking in addition to throughput is also looking at uh, latencies. So we can see that uh, parallel GC has been increased. So the performance of parallel GC has been increased between eight and 14. But we can also see that there is a huge boost in terms of um, latency improvement when it comes to uh, G1 in 14. Having said that, if we look, sorry, at this slide, at the next slide, we see in this particular case, so this is with a, with a heap of 16 gigabyte that there has been a regression between eight. Well, we, I don't have the result of G1 uh, here, but we, we, we can clearly see that there is a drop. So we had a regression basically. Um, and I don't remember the exact uh, issue um, if you want to know more about the, the given bug, it's, uh, you just need to check the blocks at the bottom of the slides. But that issue uh, has been solved. So we can clearly see that uh, G1 in 15 will improve uh, the latencies. We see that the throughput is 
is well there is a slight uh, drop in terms of throughput only 97% versus 100% well it's a small um, it's a small basically a small trade off but when we see the benefit that gives that it gives in terms of uh, latency improvement i think that it's fair to say that it's okay to pay that uh, that small price so uh quickly uh startup time uh, is something that we always look to improve in all the java release and obviously 14 is not is not an exception now we can see in this case that uh the startup time for a given uh, it's a small application it's basically a hello world application uh there is a small improvement obviously the as faster we get the more difficult it is to find large improvement but still between 13 and 14, the startup time has been improved. And I can already tell you that between 14 and 15, it will still uh, slightly uh, improve. Now, this is basically the same uh, benchmark, but with different scenarios. So a Hello World application, a Hello World application that uses Lambda expression, and then a Hello World application that is using a concat string. And again, you basically see that across all the release, we are improving the startup time uh for those different scenarios so that's something that again uh is useful over time whenever you switch to a larger to a newer version of java so now let's talk so we have discussed about um zgc which which is one of that those ambitious projects basically adding a new uh garbage collectors uh that provide low latency um, another one that uh, deal with memory uh, is Project Valhalla, and that, uh, that is a clearly very ambitious project. So uh, the goal of, Jalala, of Valhalla is basically to reboot the relationship that the GVM has with the data in memory. So if you know Java, you know that Java is very good at optimizing code. We have, for example, uh, a JIT compiler that will improve over time your code at, as it runs. Um, so on that side, we're good. Uh, but the next step is really to look on how we can optimize uh, data in memory. Now, there's an issue. Uh, we have the, J the Java type systems, uh, something that obviously is very powerful, but there is a, pri a price to pay. And sometimes we miss a bit of flexibility. Um, and that's basically due to the fact that uh, each object has an identity. Uh, it's something that obviously uh, is needed. We are not going to get rid of object identity. It enables mutability, polymorphism, and so on and so on. On the other hand, there are some use cases where um, objects might not need identity, but still today they have to pay the uh, the, the price uh, for that features, even though those objects might not benefit from uh, identity. So basically, uh, Project Valhalla is looking at how we can uh, improve the density of information within memory and uh, the thing that the team is looking at is basically how we can um, declaratively say that okay for that type of object i don't need uh, that object to handle an identity it's not something that can be done uh, automatically so uh, that will involve some help from the developer so the developer will have to specifically say oh, specifically say okay uh, for that type of object i don't need identity and then the vm will be able to improve how those uh, objects will be stored into memory and it, the vm will be uh, able to increase the density uh, the in-memory density for those type of objects another project uh, is project loom um, so if you look today uh there are well I, I will simplify a little bit but there are two types of uh, programming approach um so you have a traditional blocking approach so uh it's very easy to program to develop with the thing is that well it's so it's very easy to develop uh, it's also very easy to debug uh the thing is that that approach uh, doesn't scale as soon as your code blocks, well, basically your code is waiting for something to happen. So you are uh, using, well, you are blocking resources. That's not very effective. On the other hand, you can go for a model that is more uh, geared towards a reactive approach. The thing is that developing reactive uh, application, well, that's on one hand a very difficult model to uh, program with. And more importantly, uh, that th the code you write is very difficult uh, to, uh, to debug and hence to maintain. Typically, if you try to debug a reactive application, well, you see that something, you have an issue here, but in fact, the issue is not really happening on that. Well, 
in that region of the application, but it's happened some, somewhere else. But it's very basically, it's, it's very difficult to do correlation between an issue and where it happened within the flow of uh, the code. But still, if you want to scale, if you want to have efficient resource use of, you, you need to go toward that approach. That approach. So uh, Project Loom is basically trying to solve that by uh, making concurrency simple uh, again. How? Right now, um, the GVM is using native threads, kernel threads. Uh, Loom introduced the notion of virtual threads, which are basically tr uh, threads that are uh, managed by the GVM. So those threads are some kind of, uh, well, virtual threads, software threads that are managed and scheduled by the GVM. And obviously, the GVM will have to do mapping between those virtual threads and some underlying kernel carrier thread. But that, that is handled by the GVM. And the thing is that uh, those virtual threads are very, very cheap. So it doesn't, it's not really an issue to write code that is blocking because uh, the virtual thread that is blocking is not blocking an actual uh, underlying physical thread. So basically, you can write application using virtual thread. Your code can block, but you don't have to pay off uh, resource underutilization. So th those threads are so cheap that. Um, well, you don't even you don't even have to pull those threads. So you just uh, block the thread and you you start a new thread. Uh, it's 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 not an issue because those threads are very cheap. So that's basically what uh, Loom is trying uh, to solve. Now those days uh, we have multiple early access build of uh, Loom. Um, if we look in the platform, there are already a few jets that are uh, been that have been added in the platform for Loom, and more specifically in GDK 14 we have. Um, we have re-implemented re the legacy socket API. That was something in preparation for something that is coming in uh, GDK 15, which is uh, re-implementing the legacy data so datagram socket API, which has been done in preparation uh, of Loom. So another large project uh, is uh, Panama. So the goal of Panama is basically to enrich, to enrich the interaction between the Java virtual machine and foreign native code. Historically, uh, we had GNI for that, Java Native Interface. But GNI uh, has been specifically designed in the early days uh, to be, I would say, not friendly to use. We want to basically provide an alternative to GNI where it is uh, easy, safe, and efficient to use from Java native, to use native code uh, from Java. If we look at the de deliverables of Panama, there are three main deliverables, the foreign memory access API, which is in 14 uh, in incubator. So that's something that you can use already uh, today. It basically allows to efficiently and safely uh, use uh, of memory of that is not on the Java heap, but you can access that memory from Java code. Then there is an extraction part. It's basically the ability to extract from C uh, native header files uh, so uh, extract uh, interface and uh, generate binders that you can use directly from Java code. There are two parts for the extraction uh, parts. Th there is a tool that, me that mechanically do the extraction, but there's also an API that uh, more advanced developer can use to meet more advanced scenarios. And last but not least, uh, there's the vector API, which allows to easily express vector computation that will compile at runtime and execute on a vector uh, on CPU that support a vector, vectorized uh, extension, such as SSC uh, or uh, AVX for AMD or uh, ARM sc uh, scalable vector extension. And the vector API is right now in incubator candidate, so we don't know yet, yet uh, in which uh, uh, GDK release it will be added. So today what we have for Loom is the foreign memory access API in incubator, that's something that you can use, and we also have early access build for the extraction part. And then I also put this uh, in the Panama part, even though that uh, specific JEP is not really part of Panama, but given that it's very close to the hardware, and uh, well, I put it here. So JEP 352 uh, basically had the ability to uh, manage non-volatile uh, memory via byte buffer. That's something very specific, so I'm not going to discuss about uh, that anymore. So what I'm going to do now uh, is a very small Panama demo. 
So it takes a bit of time to switch. Okay. So let's see. So I hope that uh, it's big enough. So what I have here, uh, I have a very simple um, Java application, but first I'm going to go, let's see, where is it? Uh, no. So I'm on OS6, this is a Linux. So as any Linux, No, I don't want to do that. Uh, I forget the name. Sorry, let me check. Okay. This, this, oh, sorry. Too small. No, it's read line. So this is a header file that is part of, um, of OS6. So this is a read line a library that basically gives us a read line support, something very basic. So there are multiple function and what I want to do here is use one of the one of the read line function uh, from Java. So the first thing that I need to do is use the extract tool to basically parse the um, read line header files to uh, extract all the information and then generate the binder interface for that. So I'm going to use this uh, G extract tool. So, and I specify here that this is the path, for example, of the library, the G, the read line library. Uh, this is the path of the header file that we want to extract. And what I want is that I want the outcome to be in that uh, jar file. Uh, obviously, I'm not on the right version. So let's see. I'm on uh, 14, and I'm I need to switch. Uh, GF. So I'm going to switch to a specific uh, GDK build that support Panama, and it's 14, I think. Oops, Panama, yes. So let's invoke G extract, G extract again. Okay, bunch of warning, but this is an early access build. Okay, now I have this jar that has been generated. So what I want to do is basically, I have this small uh, Java application. We can very quickly go over the code of that application. So uh, a scope is something that is provided by um, the foreign memory, uh, the Java, the, yes, the foreign memory API of uh, Panama. And basically scope are uh, used to enforce lightness checks on scope resources. So. It's basically some, some sort of memory, but that we will allocate on the other side, so on the native side. We need to enforce liveness because uh, whenever we allocate on the other side of the fence, so on the native side, obviously at some point in time, what has been allocated needs to be uh, deallocated. So that's why we need scope. So I create a scope. Then uh, from that scope, has I allocate uh, a string. I pass, it, I pass in the string name, so we're on the on the C side. And then I'm just invoking that function that is coming from the read line library using this pointer that is defined here. So basically I'm just passing this string to the native uh, function. And what we get in return is a P uh, object, which is a pointer. And then I'm just displaying, displaying that object. So this is a two string method invocation on the P, so on the pointer object. And then I use this, this uh, static method to basically uh, get the content of that pointer. So let's uh, compile that. So Java C, Java C L. Uh, let's see, uh, class pass. Uh, I need to specify the jar, read line, and then the source. Okay, now I need to uh, run that. That guy. So uh, name, so this is uh, basically uh, this line here where we invoke the read line. So uh, this is the C uh, OS6 uh, function that is invoked. I pass it something, test. And then the result is the following. So it's a, uh, so the type is a bounded pointer. So this is this line, in fact, the two string on that uh, P object, which is a pointer. And then, um, so this is all the result 
all the two string information, all the information that we get via the two string. And then uh, the last thing is this test, which is basically uh, we ask uh, the foreign memory API to give us the content that is pointed on the other side of the fence, but by that given pointer. So this is in a nutshell uh, how uh, uh, pa um, Panama works. So if you, if you have any question, uh, you can use the chat or we can discuss at the end. It's up to you. So moving on. Another big project is uh, Project Amber. So the goal of Amber is basically to continue, continuously improve developer productivity through the evolution of the Java language. So it's not something that happened through one single release. It's something that we have started around uh, Java 10. And uh, since Java 10, we have added uh, new features which are basically emerging from Project Amber. Uh, var is a big one, so variable type inference was added in 10. Um, in uh, 14, we're adding switch expression. It becomes a standard features after two rounds of preview. Uh, we're doing another round of preview for text blocks. Uh, we are introducing records. Uh, we're int introducing also pattern matching uh, with instance of in preview two. So I'm going to discuss uh, most of those features. So the first one is a uh, records. So um, records basically uh, give you the ability to, um, so they, they are providing a very uh, compact syntax for declaring class, which are data holder. So basically a tuple, an immutable uh, uh, tuple in which you can store data and that's something that you can basically uh, pass around. Uh, I'm going to show you how it works, so you will see that, well, it's something that is, uh, on one hand, very simple, but on the other hand, uh, very efficient. Something else that is coming from uh, uh, Amber is uh, text blocks. So basically, text blocks are um, multi-line string literals. So uh, take the following example. So you want to store uh, the HTML that we have on the left side. Typically, you would do something in your code. With uh, text blocks, you can now uh, do that. So you basically keep the, the syntax as it is. You don't have to escape anything. This is something which is very convenient for uh, dealing with XML, JSON, YAML, SQL, and so on. But again, that's something that we will see uh, in a demo in a minute. Then uh, we have a pattern matching. That's something that we will see in the demo. It will be more clear. And finally, we have a new switch expression. So let's go to the demo that will be uh, more concrete. So let's see. Uh, well, IntelliJ has already started. So I'm going to very quickly create a new project. Um, I need to configure my compiler because I don't know why, but by default it generates uh, Java C5 bytecode. And then I also need to configure my project. And I'm going to increase the font uh, for the code, don't worry. So here, given that I'm going to use, oh, sorry, it's not here, it's here. Given that I'm going to use some preview feature, I need to specifically tell to IntelliJ that I want to use preview features because preview features are not enabled by default. And I also need to do it, uh, let's see here. So again, I'm gonna use 14 preview features. Okay. So, uh, source, okay. So, Let's, let's just run that and see if it works. Okay, yeah, it works. So the first thing that I'm gonna show you is records. So let's create a record. Uh, let's say that we want to create a record for a person and a person as a name and a person as a, a first name. And that's it. It's all we have to do. 
Now what I can, what I can do uh, in my code uh, is the following, for example. Um, so I can create a record. And today's speakers is uh, the Labasse David. Oops. Oops, sorry. It's obviously not a record, but a person. Okay. So now I have the speaker object that I can use. So for example, a speaker. So let's run that. So this is the result. So uh, this is basically the two, the, the two string method that is invocated on uh, that uh, speaker object. So let's have a look at what has been, uh, what we are here. So target class, we should have two class. So we have the test class and we have this person class. So this is our record. So if we look at the record itself, so just by this simple declaration, we see that we have a few methods that have been generated. So uh, generated. So the class person is final. It extends Java Lang records. It has a few methods. So it has a constructor. It has a two string. It has a it has a default hash code method. It has an equals, and then it has togethers, last and first name. So that means that I can, for example, uh, invoke one of those, and we you see one of those methods, and you see that this time we have the Labasse instead of the two string. So what we can do, if we look at the record itself, obviously this is the default behavior. I haven't specified anything. Uh, I can define my own constructor. So uh, person. I can say, for example, that, uh, let's see. Um, We want to uppercase uh, all the names, right? So let's run that. So you see that oops, the Labasse is now in uppercase. And you see that the only thing I had to do is basically, uh, I had just have to specify what needs to be done with one of the, the fields. I didn't have to specify anything uh, for the first field, so it has the default behavior. But now if I'm doing uh, something like this, for example, uh, if, uh, let's see, uh, last uh, is blank, then uh, this last equal, uh, no, Nemos. Here the compiler will uh, complain because uh, last might not have been initialized. So if we go through this branch, of course, last is in, last is initialized, but that means that we, if we have a else, it won't be. Uh, so if last name is not blank, it won't be initialized. So to solve that, basically, we need to add a, in this case, a else, and uh, so else uh, this last equals last. In this case, we have a default a second branch, and in this case, it, it works. So if I have a blanks, let's run that. And you see that this time, oops, sorry. It's the, the first name is anonymous because it is blank. So th that's basically how a record works. Um, the next thing, uh, text blocks. So uh, let's see. Uh, for that, I'm gonna yes. So this is the my uh, the pom that has been generated. So it's just some XML. So it's the pom from my project. And uh, well, I want to create a string for that. So for that, I'm gonna use a text block. So for that, I'm use the tr triple quotes. And that's all it takes. Now I can do uh, so pom south 
if I run that, well, you see that the text blocks has been is correctly including the identification because here I'm, I basically copy uh, the HTML as it was. So what I what I've done here is basically I kept the identification, but obviously we probably don't want to have all those space in front. That's something that uh, text block handles uh, for us. Uh, something else that we can do is, for example, the following with text blocks. So uh, they're not able to, eval to evaluate expression, but Well, let's just do that. So I uh, had it a uh, person has here, and now I can use formatted. And uh, let's see. And what I want here uh, is the speaker uh, first, for example. So let's run that. Uh, Yep, sorry, typo. It's a method. So if we look at the HTML, you, we see that he, well, it's not class, but it's the first name, but you get the ID. So basically we can do some kind of cheap uh, uh, expression interpolation using formatted with text blocks. So that's basically how text works, text blocks works. Now let's move on to another features of, um, Humber and that's uh, let's uh, pattern matching. So uh, pattern matching. So you see we have this uh, speaker object, which in fact is a person. So that means that uh, we can do something like uh, speaker uh, first, right? So we would get David, but it might happen that the type of that object is, uh, of that, yes, of that speaker would be object. In that case, obviously, we cannot directly invoke the, the first method. So what we would typically do is something like this. So if a speaker instance of, uh, it's a person, so if it's a person, then, What we do, we create a new uh, object. So it's a person object, x equal to a speaker, but we have to specifically cast it to a person type. And here, obviously, we want to use the x object, so that works. So the thing is that here you see that uh, if we have this type, we create an object of that same type, and we cast it from the other object using that same type. There are a lot of repetition going on. What we can do now with pattern matching instance of in GDK 14 is the following. So we declare the new variable here, and that's it. So if you run this, We'll get the exact, the exact same behavior. So hello, David, this is the first one. And hello, David, this is the second one. And you see that this one is more succinct, so it's uh, more obvious uh, to use. So um, the last one, and I'm probably going to skip that one because it takes a bit of time, uh, is the switch expression. So it's a new type of uh, ex switch expression. Um, that works uh, like this. So this is on the left side, this is uh, how it traditionally works. Uh, the thing is that, for example, um, here there's a bug in the sense that uh, there is no break here. So if I do a switch on, let's say Friday, well, number of character will be six and then it will be seven. So that would be the uh, end result, uh, seven. Um, in this case, I'm doing a switch over an enumeration. So all the values are no because we're in an enumeration, but still. Uh, if I miss, for example, one of the day, the compiler will not be able to tell me, okay, you are not evaluating a witness day, for example. So that's why we have a default. But given that um, we know all the value, the default is a bit, uh, well, it, it's a bit hard to have to use a default value. Uh, so what we can do, oh, there is a question. Uh, will, will we be able to use record as, uh, as GB, GP entities? Um, not directly, something that, well, you can use records with GPA, but the thing that uh, you have to keep in mind is that records are uh, immutable. So you cannot change rec any fields as soon as it has been created. 
So uh, let's go back to this uh, to the switch expression. Um, this is the new switch expression. Uh, it basically uh, returns the value directly. So something we were not able to do in the former switch expression. So that well, th that's why this is on the left side the switch statement, and this is an expression because it returns the value. So we have all the case. Uh, given that again we are doing a case on enumeration, the compiler will test tell us if if uh, for example we are missing a day. So if we are missing a day, either we had uh, this day or we have to deal with the default value. Um, if we are dealing with all the days and if um, we have a default value, the default will never be reached. So that's something that the compiler can uh, can also uh, infer, that the default branch will, is basically a dead branch, those kind of things. Uh, so that's, in a nutshell, the switch expression. So I'm going to move a little bit because I'm a bit ahead of time. Oops, sorry, shouldn't. My bad. I switch the slide. I should switch moved out of the slides. So the Ember demo. We have seen the Ember demo. So um, those are some of the project that the, the more ambitious long-term project that we are working on. What we see is that gradually some of the features emerging from those projects are added uh, in Java. So we've seen the foreign memory coming uh, from Loom, for example. We've seen how Humber has added multiple features uh, since Java 10 in the Java platform. But obviously, the Java platform is not all about a huge and ambitious project. Uh, in 14, we have this new helpful null pointer exception, JEP358. So we have all seen, uh, seen that kind of code where we basically have uh, null pointers. So it's not a big deal because the, we know where the null pointers happen, so line 666. So we just have to look at that line, right? The thing is that line might look like uh, the following. So uh, we know that it happened here, but we really have no idea uh, where it happened exactly. That's what the null pointers, uh, the helpful null pointers uh, option gives us. So that's something that you have to explicitly enable in uh, 14. And now you will have something like this. So it cannot involve the city get, get district uh, because the return value of uh, get city is null. So it basically gives us uh, more information to help us to pinpoint uh, the exact issue that raised that new pointers. So that's something that is available, available as a standard feature in 14. Uh, it's not enabled, enabled by default. And I've seen some discussion where uh, in 15, it might be enabled by default. So it's a, it's a small features, but it's a very convenient uh, features. Um, GDK Flight Recorder is something that uh, is available, I think, since Java 11. And the basic idea of GDK, of Flight Recorder, GFR, it's a black box that keeps track of events that are emitted by different components within the GDK itself. So it can be the, the GVM, it can be your code. So a bunch of events are uh, raised and uh, GFR will keep track uh, of them. And that's something that you can use uh, after the fact to do some kind of analysis. The thing is that GFR is very low overhead. So that's something that you can use in production to basically uh, detect and pinpoint specific issue. Something that we're having in uh, uh, GDK 14 is uh, event streaming. So until now, um, the, the way you were using GFR was the following. So you start the recording of your application. Uh, so uh, you, you use your application, then you stop the recording. You dump the content of the event to a repository, and then you process uh, those events. Now, uh, an application that is running has the ability to uh, stream out uh, events as they happen. So you can basically do a... Uh, you can have some 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 cough, some cough, some sort of sidecar application to do analysis uh, of the event as they happen. Um, so there is a specific API to do that in GDK 14. The thing is that obviously we are keeping, uh, we are improving uh, GFR through all the release. So uh, in 14 we are we had 145 uh, different event types for GFR and in 15 I've checked in the latest, well it's not the latest build because we have done a 22 build yesterday but in the build of last week we are we had 157 uh, GFR event type. So it it keeps, GFR it in itself uh, keeps to have more um, metrics within the platform that you can use and not only that you can also uh, write your own custom and event type for your application. 
something else that is part of GDK 14 is this new packaging tool, uh, JEP, uh, JEP 343. Right now, it's still in an incubation phase. So the idea of that tool is uh, it's a tool that gives you the ability to create native installer uh, specific for a given platform. So on Windows, you will either have an MSI or an exe file. On macOS, you will have a pack, uh, package file or a DMG and so on and so on. Um, and it has a lot of uh, additional, um, I would say, native uh, features such as the ability to um, pass uh, parameters to the native uh, executable that will invoke, that will do the installation of your Java application. It obviously works with JLinks and so on and so on. So that's something that you can use today to basically create native installer for your Java code. Now let's quickly look at uh, Java 15. So that's the schedule, nothing will change on that front. So this is a, a table that I did, uh, well, I did it yesterday and I checked uh, this morning, it was still uh, up to date. So those are the multiple jobs that will be part of uh, 15. Um, I'm going to discuss specifically two uh, JEPs, uh, that is uh, hidden class and uh, where is the other one? Uh, sealed, uh, sealed type, sealed class. It's not here. Yeah, I don't. See, oh, yeah, I missed one. Well, anyway, it's on my slide later on. Oh, yeah, it's here. Sorry, it's it. Uh, the other one is sealed class. So, the, the, so. This slide shows uh, the JEP that are um, either integrated, so already in uh, the early build of GDK 15, or they are targeted. So, the in sorry, uh, targeted means that uh, we intend to add them to 15, or we propose to target them. So, so, that's basically the first step before we integrate them. So, we tell the community, okay, we want to add that to 15. Is there any objection? If not, we will. Uh, it will move to to targeted, and then uh, once the works is done, uh, it will move from targeted to integrated. So basically, there is a very high chance that all the JEPs uh, here will be part of uh, uh, GDK uh, 15. Just keep in mind the small disclaimer that we might uh, find a big issue in one of those one of the JEP here, and we might decide to remove it at the very last minute. So that there, there is always a risk. And then there are a, a few other JEPs that are currently being worked on. And we don't know yet if they will be part of uh, 15. So uh, one is sealed class. And uh, well, there are a bunch of JEPs, but I just took three where uh, clearly there are a lot of act activities going on right now. So maybe they will be part of 15. We will see in a few uh, weeks. And at worst, uh, by uh, early June, we will know uh, for sure if they are part of 15 or not. So sealed class, foreign memory access, second incubator. So that's part of Project Loom. And then the vector API, which is also part of Project Loom. So I'm going to very quickly discuss uh, hidden class and uh, sealed class, which are often confused. So a hidden class is something that is very specifically, that has been specifically done for uh, uh, frameworks developers. So if we look at frameworks, um, they have this habit of dynamically generating uh, classes and use those classes uh, through reflection. The thing is that those classes, given that they are generated, can potentially be used by uh, uh, other ex slash external bytecode, something that we clearly don't want. So basically, the ability of hidden class gives now a frameworks developer the ability to still generate dynamically uh, classes on the fly, but those classes are hidden uh, for the rest of the world. So only the frameworks that generate those classes will be able to use those classes. So it targets frameworks developers. Uh, but if we look at Java C, for example, Java C is also using that techniques, uh, for example, for Lambda expression. So that's something that is also useful uh, for Java itself. And one of the things that will be done in addition to creating this new facility is also deprecating the, the Sun Miscon safe define anonymous classes that is used exactly for doing that dynamically generating, generating classes. So if we look at the properties of those classes, well, in terms of discover, discoverability, um, they shouldn't be basically discoverable, discoverable by classes outside of the classes that has created uh, that classes. Um, in terms of life cycle, um, it should, those classes should be able to be uh, aggressively unloaded uh, to give the frameworks the ability to uh, generate a lot of classes 
And as soon as those classes are not needed, they will be automatically uh, garbage collected. Now, they can be garbage collected through a more traditional approach. Uh, that's something that is the behavior of the GC uh, is configurable for hidden classes. But what we know for sure is that uh, the aggressive unloading is something that is needed. And then access control. That basically gives us uh, the ability for a class that creates dynamically a, another class to access that class, but that also prevent other classes external to that classes to ac access that uh, newly created class. So that's basically in a nutshell hidden classes. It's not something that you're going to use that most of the developers like you and me will use. It's clearly something for frameworks developers. And then uh, there are uh, seed class, and some people tend to confuse the two. They are completely different. So. Um, before we talk about seed class, we need to quickly talk about inheritance. So inheritance is something that uh, encourages code reuse. So we basically have a class hierarchy and all the class, for example, a class that extends the class uh, can reuse um, features from the, the class that it extends for. Now, the thing is that the class hierarchy uh, is most of the, well, is often used for uh, code reuse. But sometimes it's used for something completely different. So the class hierarchy is, um, is sometimes also used to model different possibility of a given of a given domains. So, for example, uh, we want to model the different shapes that are supported by graphic applications. So we would have a shape, a class, or interface, and then we have, have uh, subclasses that would extend that shape uh, classes, like a square extend the shapes, an hexagon extend the shapes, and so on. Or we we can have a class that represents the type of vehicles that we sell, and then we would have, a, I don't know, a CV, a coupe, a sedan, and so on that extends that uh, super classes. So that's a different something uh, that is completely different. And the problem is that uh, right now, if you have this shape super class that is extended by triangle, circle, hexagon, and so on, you cannot prevent any other class to also extend it. And that's something that we would like to address uh, with a seed class. So seed class would basically uh, allow us to have a given class hierarchy that is bounded. So it, the class hierarchy can only be extended by class within uh, that uh, limited closed class hierarchy and not by any external classes. And obviously, code reuse would still be possible, but it would only be possible within domain, within the boundary of the closed class hierarchy. So how does that work? Well, let's have a look at an example that would be uh, more obvious. So I have this uh, shape super class, and we have two new keywords. So uh, we have sealed. That is used to basically say, OK, the class shape uh, is sealed. And then we have the permits keyword that tells which class or interface can use that super class. So sealed uh, is, sorry, shape is sealed. And only in this example, circle, circle rectangle, and square are allowed to uh, extend uh, the shapes. And then there are a few variations, like the, the fact that if you are within the same package or the same modules, you can just use uh, the class name. You don't have the, to use the full uh, uh, package name. If you have nested class, so all the classes within a single uh, file source, you just seal the super class. And by default, all the classes that are present in the same source file will be uh, permitted by default to extend that uh, super, super class. So that's basically uh, how it works. Now, it's not clear today if seal class will be part of uh, GDK 15. If not, that's not really an issue. Uh, just mean that we'll have to wait another six months, and it will be for GDK uh, 16. So um, I think it's time to wrap up. So. Um, Today, we've discussed about uh, what new features will be added to Java uh, in 2020. So uh, GDK 14 was released two months ago, and GDK 15 will be released in uh, four months from now. I've also discussed very quickly on how those large, ambitious, long-term projects are basically uh, gradually adding capabilities into the platform with the ultimate goal goals of uh, revamping completely the platform. 
Now, I, I, I need to quickly discuss another new project that we have just uh, announced two weeks ago, and that is Leiden. So uh, Leiden basically tried to solve, to tackle some of the pain points of Java, and that is the slow startup time, the slow time to performance, and uh, the large footprint of Java, Java application. And everything is relative. When I say slow, it's, co it's slow compared to typically native Go applications, for example. Footprint, uh, it's again compared to native application. So basically, uh, Leiden tried to tackle those pain points by introducing the concept of a static uh, image to Java, something similar to a Graal VM native image. Um, Leiden aims to leverage uh, existing components of the GDK, such as Hotspot, uh, GAOTC, which is an AOT compiler that we have in experimental form uh, since GK9 uh, into the platform, but also uh, CDS and Glink. And clearly, this is just the early days of Leiden. We have just uh, started to uh, gather uh, interest uh, around that project. But I th we think that over time, this is something that will be important. So basically, try bring the capability that we have with native MIAM, the similar uh, capabilities, but directly uh, into the Java platform. So this is this slides uh, depict the content of GDK uh, 14. I think that we have discussed most of the gems that we have here. Uh, the only thing that I need to mention, and I think I've mentioned that at the beginning, is that JEPs are, are also used to remove uh, holder things from the platform. So you see that, for example, 362 and 363 are deprecating uh, things from the platform and uh, or removing. So when we remove something from the platform, we first deprecate to tell the world that, OK, that features will be removed in the features. And then later on, it will be re actually removed. So it's a multi-phase. Uh, uh, removal approach. And uh, GDK 14 is available, so you should download it right now and give it a try. So uh, in terms of conclusion, Java is still free. Uh, we have put in place everything to deliver faster, and we are delivering faster, and we haven't had a richest uh, feature pipeline for the Java platform uh, ever. And um, also keep in mind, uh, this year marked the 25th anniversary of Java. And given the pipeline that we have, well, we can clearly say that there's a bright future for Java developers. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your time. And I don't know if we still have time for questions. Um, Party, we have time for one question. Someone has yep. a question. You can also ask questions on Twitter. So there is my Twitter handle there. So if you have any question and you don't feel like asking now, you can also ping me on Twitter. I think Srini has a question. Yeah. So uh, I, this, is a, this is a question regarding the project, uh, Project Valhalla. So there was the, uh, the last uh, thing uh, I was actually looking into is, is, the, is the problem of type erasures in, in, in uh, uh, type erasure in general. So that is a real, that's a more complicated problem in, in, in Project Valhalla. So what is the state of it? And is there a, is there a, um, uh, is, a is that, is that mountain climbed? And then when, when it's expected to deliver it? <laughs> so, 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 you know, Brian Goetz, the Java architect. So Brian is the architect of the Java platform. And uh, basically his answer is it will be, del so w whenever someone asks about when it will be delivered, his answer is, is pretty uh, easy. It will be available it will be available uh, when it's ready. And uh, the fact that, well, it's not yet there means that, well, things are still being, being uh, worked on. So I cannot give you any more precise answer than that. But yeah, you're right. Uh, Valhalla is, um, is really a fundamental change uh, within the platform. The, the nice thing is that uh, with the new release cadence, uh, well, we don't have the issue that we, have, we had in the past where we basically had a time window to add new features in the platform every three years. So if we miss that uh, time window, that basically means that we have to wait another three years to add that uh, into the platform. Those days, we can gradually add features uh, every six months. So we can expect in the, f in the future release to come uh, to see some uh, features emerging from Valhalla. But I, can, I can't give you any more precise answer than that. I'm sorry.
you, David. Thanks a lot for your presentation. Thank you. Thanks you. Thank you for your time. <laughs> okay. Thanks everyone for joining. So see you next time. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye.